This is The Skinny with Rico Elmore and Adam Ritz. Brought to you by Fatheads, the undisputed leader in oversized eyewear. And welcome to The Skinny with your host, Rico Elmore. I'm your co-host, Adam Ritz. We are coming to you live from the uh, Fathead Suite on the turn two of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway with special guest and Indy 500 legend, Bobby Unzer. Hi, Bobby. Nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, 50 years past winning here. I I watched a little bit of the uh, thing that you did with Dave first. Very cool. Very cool. Can you uh, relive a little bit of that and what was going on that day when you ran? Well, 50 years. Jeez. Number one, Doug, the big boss here, gives me a call. Now, he never calls me. I call him. When I'm hustling something, you know what it's like, Rico. Yes, sir. I, I call Doug, and, and he'll always figure out a way to get back to me or answer the phone, whatever. So he calls me one morning. And I thought, that's a little strange. You know, it means he wants something. <laughs> Normally like me. Right. And, and so he says, I want you to do the parade. I says, man, Doug, I, I don't do those parades. I did them for years, you know. It's, it's enough, you know. I mean, I don't particularly like the parades, I guess. So he says, Bobby, he says, do you realize you've been here this is your 50th year since you won your first race here. Well, there I am really quick, taking my pen out. I'm on my desk. I'm adding and subtracting because I can't do it in my head like you can. <laughs> Rico can do that. Some people can't. I can't. So I'm there. I said, man, it's really been 50 years. How could it be 50 years? And so I said, Doug, number one. If you really want it done, I'll always do it for you. That's good. I mean, that's your standard. Number two, 50 years? I says, I didn't think I'd been been there that long. I mean, 50 years is a long time. It's a long time. So, And I didn't believe it until I figured it out <laughs> on my paper there, you know? So I says, yeah. I was coming back anyway, but I wasn't going to do the parade anyway. And I'm telling you, we got more happy people in the parade. I mean... Talk about a turn on. My wife is there, and I brought my two daughters back this year. Awesome. And and they just liked it so much. In other words, it was just a total different deal. So I told Doug, I said, they need to be on the trailer. And then we got Dave Shaw. Dave Shaw, of all the guys, he was the number two man until last year around the speedway yep. here. Yep. And he quit and went to the airport, run the airport now. Yep. And that's all fine because Dave – it's one of my best friends, you know. And so Doug calls Dave up. That, that's the big boss calling what used to be the second big boss up. Yep. And he says, Bobby's going to do the parade. I need some help. And so Dave Shaw, hey, one of my best friends that I have. So he's thinking, what does he need for Bobby? And so he told him, he says, we need Bobby to be in the parade, and we need you to make sure that it all goes well. The float gets built. They're going to build a float for us, which they did. It's a pretty nice float. And, <laughs> and we just had a friggin' ball. My two daughters went with me, and my wife went with me, and they were up there shaking around on the thing and waving at the people. And, and I mean, the thing ends up being fun. Yeah. Not like the old, deals, old days, because Mario and I used to go. And, and get in the back of the convertibles. Yep. Like now we yep. got yep. orange yep. ones this yep. year. That's what we used. This way it was really fun because yep. we had a whole float, had the people on both sides, and they were really, I mean, I had a lot of fans out there. Oh, you're a fan favorite for sure. And the answer to Well, name, I mean, uh, yeah. It, you know, when you win, uh, if they would have said uh, uh, in 50 years you're going to have your own float in the 500 parade, what would you have said 50 years ago? Oh, I wouldn't have believed I'd be here 50 years. I mean, who would have ever thought it was going to last this long? You know? The I mean, second largest parade next to the Macy's Day Parade. Can you yeah. believe that? In other it's words, amazing. I mean, they, Little they, Indianapolis up yeah. next to New York City. Mm-hmm. And, and I didn't remember that. It's been so long since I've been in yeah. the parade. And, and so when, when Doug calls, he's telling me these same numbers, and I said, huh, well. 
Well, I knew it was big, and I used to go in it every year, but I just quit going to it, you know? So you get started in racing. How does it start? I know about, and I want to talk about Pikes Peak because anybody that drive that course, I was watching some stuff on it after we were talking. I, of course, you know, know about the modern-day Pikes Peak. And quite like what it no. was then. So uh, they, they can wreck anything. Just give it to some people. Yeah, Rico, and they'll give get it wrecked. Don't people. worry about it. I mean, so, did you? Where did you start at in racing? What was your original? Albuquerque, New Mexico, and uh, I was 15 years old, and uh, they were all grown ups that we were running against, and it was the original Hot Rod Magazine did a study on this many years ago. But the, uh, the, the whole answer was, is super modified racing started in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Then it went, of course, to Phoenix and Tucson and wherever have you, you know, Colorado Those are and things like that. unbelievably fast yeah. cars. Yeah. Crazy fast. And, and just a little fact for you, this suite before we bought it was Hot Rod Magazine suite. Oh, this was? This You're was. You're kidding. Uh-uh. They used and if to... if you look over on that door over there, the sliding door, you can see where we peeled the letters off. Hot yeah. Rod. <laughs> Hot Rod Magazine used to sponsor my older brother, Jerry, who got killed here in 1959. Mm-hmm. And in Hot Rod Magazine, they all of a sudden, because of Jerry and Ray Brock, it's a guy's name, it's going back a long time. <clears throat> but at any rate, they just sponsored my brother and most everything he did. So I'll bet you that's the reason they had this suite back then. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. But it's so funny when we first bought it the first year, which is this goes back f- five or six now. Linda Vaughn's walking down through here. She'd been <laughs> yeah. down at Bill Simpson's, you know, and she's walking down through here. She said, hey, Rico, are you in the hot rod suite? I said, well, it was Hot Rod, honey. Now it's ours. That's mine. Yeah. And she said, she said, oh, so they're not here. I said, you're always welcome, but they're not here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> She's welcome everywhere. Swedish girl. Oh, She's my She's been God. into this friggin' racing, Rico, as long as I have, yeah. I think, you know? So, so, so I go to a thing at Prime 47, my buddy's restaurant downtown, and, uh, it was something to do with Mario, and uh, uh, Mario was the guest of honor, and she was she was the host, I think, or something like that. And Linda's up there, and she says, and I'm sure that this is why she said it. You know how honor she is sometimes with the you know the things she says. She says, she says, and, and, and she was off mic, and then she said, let, "Let me have that mic again." She grabs the mic, and she says, "I just want everybody to know." that I have never been sexually harassed in the automotive racing business. And I thought, okay, wow. so, I, so I thought to myself, so how many have you harassed? <laughs> that was better. That was better. Yeah. I like that one. And that's why she yeah. said it, because she's always jacked with people, you know, yeah. having a good Someday time. Someday it's got to be our turn, you know. I'm talking about the male. That's know? right. That's right. Uh. So, uh, but anyhow, so super modifieds is the start. So it's you and who who was it? You well, and the, Al? Or no, you? there there was three brothers that were yeah. going. Al was too young then. Yep. I mean, we were too young. But you know, in those days, the the laws, everything, drinking, everything was twenty one. But you know, they really didn't care in Albuquerque. The fans loved us. In other words, I I was going to to school at the time, which I didn't do very long. In other words, as soon as I started racing, I thought, what the heck would I go to school for? I'm going to be a race driver. This is stupid, you know? I totally understand that. Waste of time. And it paid off. (laughs) Well, I mean. (laughs) For you, it worked. It worked, but I don't tell the kids that I talk to 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 quit school (laughs) for any reason. Well, I don't tell them to quit either, see. I'm, I'm proud to say that I was... 275 out of 278 kids in my graduating class. So I almost quit, but I went ahead and finished up just third from last. So third from last. <laughs> I I just I just didn't. So I I I just quit school. I mean, the only thing I did was English and auto mechanics and the wrestling team. So no reason to keep doing that. The girls always did my English for me. So. Yeah. Yeah. Some girl did it, you know. I mean, I didn't do anything in school. My auto mechanics teacher, 
I mean, I knew so much more about the cars than he did. He'd give me 35 cents to go down and go to the movie during his time that he has me in the auto mechanics class. Get lost. <laughs> yeah, get lost, you know. <laughs> well, just walking a little ways down to the first theater, you know. So yeah. go, go and watch a movie, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Well, well, folks well, wouldn't give me the 35 cents to duck school, but the teacher would, you know. So, sounds to me they were forcing you out, yeah. so we'll go with that. Yeah, forcing <laughs> me out. So anyway, then I started uh, expanding my racing because I'd go to Phoenix every once in a while. And then a little bit later, got to go into California. What was CRA. Phoenix? What, what was the track in Phoenix at the time? The half-mile dirt. Okay. That's all I ran. Okay. Yeah. And, and a couple of other track south mountain yeah. a few other tracks yeah. tucson yeah tucson and just all the tracks were, and phoenix was kind of a boom place for racing in those days yep. they had a lot of good race drivers came out of there yep. and some good cars yep. basically uh cra cars yep it, you know it was arizona was it manzanita and, that was there forever manzanita yeah, yeah that was it yeah, yeah. yeah. Manzanita. manzanita that's what i thought it I think was you got a pretty good memory rico yeah. <laughs> I remember a couple of things. So. And a good friend of mine ran Manzanita, yep. Keith, uh, whatever, and, and we were good friends, but it didn't make any difference. It wasn't a political deal. It was racing. And Phoenix had a lot of good race fans, so that's where I'd go a lot, more than any place. But then I got to where I was going to L.A., call it Compton, California, Yep. Ascot. Ascot. The famous sure. Ascot. Every yeah. weekend. Agajanians, right? Agajanian. Yep. He was one of my really, really close friends, you know? Yep. In other words, that's did a the lot guy. for motorsports. Oh, he did a bunch. Yep. I mean, I, I have one Pikes Peak one year. I got to tell you about this real quick. And, and it was a good payday year. In other words, really made some money. And it was my own car. So as soon as I got, went home and got my bills paid, very few times did I ever charge anything that I couldn't pay for. But with a race car, I, I just couldn't afford all that at one time. So I got the magneto and the wheels from Halibrand and got all that stuff from somebody. Now I got to pay it. Well, it was a good pay year at Pikes Peak, and I won it. And so I went to work and uh, got home and, and paid my bills, bought an airplane. Thirty three hundred bucks. That's all the money I had left. Paid thirty three hundred bucks for an airplane because I had to go to California every weekend. And, okay. And that driving. So that's why you became the pilot. Well, yeah, yeah. And awesome. I didn't have a license, so but I bought the airplane, oh. and and I and I really, 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 I don't know how I could afford it because that was all my money that was left. But I'd go to California. Aggie would give me one hundred and fifty bucks sometimes couple of hundred bucks for being there and and who had a had a in the business parnelli jones he had a he had a flying club his chief mechanic johnny polson ran the, ran the flying deal of course not when they're racing back here in the summer yeah but polson took the liking to me one day i'm going out there in my airplane i land there at compton and polson says now Give me the key to that airplane. Polson was kind of a strong, force, forceful guy, but a nice man. Got dang arms as big as my legs, you know, <laughs> big as yours, Rico. <laughs> and and Polson said, leave that airplane here. Well, my airplane, I'd pour the oil in the top, and I'd try to fly it while it was running out the bottom, you know, and get something. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was worn out, you know. And Polson got tired of me doing this. And and so he just said, leave the plane here and get your plane home. It was Texas International or something before Southwest. Yep. So I got that home. I thought, wow, he's going to try to stop them oil leaks for sure. Well, the engine was worn out and junk, you know. So he took the whole thing out. The crankshaft was cracked. The case was cracked. I mean, everything was junk. And that Polson <laughs> fixed that whole thing up for me. And he knew I didn't have any money, and so he didn't charge me any money. He and, saved your life. <laughs> oh, I tell you what, and I'm flying that thing at night half the time too. I mean, talk about being and, and no license, you know. So I is mean, that when I, you met Parnelli then, or was it? No, uh, ironically, I didn't meet him then. I didn't meet Parnelli until Pikes Peak, 
Now, he had seen me run some sprint cars because he was already, what, the golden-haired boy in the whole United States of America in racing. He, he was already young, a legend. And, and all I could do is look goo-goo-eyed at the guy, you know. And, and, uh, but, but I didn't have a chance to meet him. And yet, he's Agajanian's number one hit man, if you want to call it that, or his driver. Yep. And I mean, that was just the way it was. And so he was probably one of the smartest of, I mean, I mean, one of not the smartest, but there's a lot of you guys that are very smart with the way you did things. Uh, but with his investments and all the property in California, Agajanian. It, yeah. I mean, they own the whole side <laughs> of the mountain there. Yeah. I mean, crazy, crazy money. I'm amazed that, that you bought an airplane about, about what age were you? In your career, oh. when you when you went up and, and bought an airplane, was, and, and I mean, I know what that 22. means now. If you buy an airplane now, that's a pretty big deal. This wasn't was much of an airplane. Then? I'm going to tell you this what. This wasn't you, much of an airplane. It was a debate whether you're going to walk or ride with me, you know. <laughs> I mean, were people like, Bobby didn't even graduate from high school, and now he just bought an airplane. Or was well, it? again, this wasn't much of a plane, <laughs> but it would fly. I'm holding you know? too much stock in the, in the oh, fact that it's an airplane. I mean, I, I didn't know about it weather i i couldn't fly bad weather <laughs> and if i run into clouds somewhere i just land on a little dirt road somewhere wait till it blows over and crank it up and go again but somehow or another i always got to the racetrack that always on a, what, a saturday night probably yeah right <clears throat> and i had to be home and remember it was taking me 18 hours to drive out there and and it was all open range. That means the Indian didn't have any fences. And I got to go through all that country with the sheep and the cows on the road. And I mean, and if you hit one, you got to pay for it. And you got to do it on the spot. Well, I don't have that much money. I can't do that. It was you know? cheaper to buy an airplane than yeah. hit a cow pa- and pay for it. Oh, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And so I what mean, was it to fly? How much, how far to... Uh, fly time to get there well i could make i had to make one stop prescott arizona yep. so so it'd take me seven hours in other words i could fly it in seven hours 18 hours to drive yeah. so that's pretty easy choice oh that was that's man. even worth risking yeah. your life apparently and and, oil I mean, like, all, all the racing all the hundreds of miles an hour on a track was not the most dangerous thing you've done it's flying an airplane that, that was barely oh, an airplane we had some trying times uh, one the... time, one, now my, yeah, you know, I got married here and there, you know, and, <laughs> and and so I make a little money here and there, you know. I, the endorsement business started being fairly good, and, and long story short, I, I one day I go over to the airport, and the guy that owns the airport, Mr. Cutter, big company, right? Mr. Cutter and my dad were really good friends. He knew that my dad didn't have a lot of money because some of the airport was on my father's property, and they don't ever talk about it. They just do it. That's just the way it was. And so I go over to the airport one day to get my little thing and go someplace, and Mr. <laughs> Cutter is standing there, and, and he says, Bobby, give me the keys to that. He hated Cessna's because he was a Beechcraft dealer. Yep, see? sure. And a big yep. one. Yep. And so he says, give me the key to that airplane of yours out there and sit under a tree out there to get a little shade, you know. And so I don't know why he wants that. That's strange. But, I mean, Mr. Cutter's a big man, you know, so I give him the key to my plane. And he, he gives me a key to another plane. He says, this is your airplane. That one is mine now. And I says, and, and he's given me a bonanza. This is too high on the pecking order. This doesn't make sense. I have no money. In other words, God, I have no way to pay for that. Yep, right. And so I told Mr. Cutter, I says, Mr. Cutter, I have, I have no money. I says, people might think I'm rich, but I'm telling you, I'm plenty poor. I don't have any money. But he says, and, and he was probably right, I'm going to get myself killed if I keep flying in that airplane because he knows I don't have a license. He knows I shouldn't be up in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> he knows all these things. And so oh, that's I said, good. okay. I says, well, he said, don't worry about it. I got somebody who's going to check you out right now. <laughs> so he puts his, one of his pilots says, go show Bobby how to fly this airplane. <laughs> well, now I got a bonanza. Now I can make California without stopping at Prescott. 
In other words, Albuquerque straight to Compton, California, with no stops in between. Now I'm really big shot. How know? quick can you get there then? Oh, I think I think that one was taking me about probably five hours. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's like setting a world record, right? Oh, Compared to what you were I mean, doing. Albuquerque to, to basically L.A. Wow, that was a good deal. Yeah. I mean, yeah. L.A.'s always got bad. Remember in those days, you couldn't see anywhere. Yeah, You'd the smog. start going down yeah. into the valley, and it smells so bad. You thought, think that you're going to die before you get there. <laughs> oh, my God. I the mean, well, fumes, that was, the carbon monoxide. You're like, get me oh, in a I race mean, car where I'm you, safe. You yeah. can't <laughs> see. You cannot see. Yeah. If an airport's five miles down the road, I don't see it till I get to Two miles. You can't see out there. Yeah. It is that way all the time. So here I am becoming an IFR pilot because I still can't see where I'm going, you know. And so I'd fly that thing. Of course, it would just never get shut off. Just fly, fly, fly. Racetrack and racetrack. Racetrack back home. And I had a garage I was running those days too, see. So Simpson had a Cessna of some sorts. I don't know what it was. I, that, he was telling the story the that other day. That was a jet. Well, no, he was telling this is a plane that he had down in Mexico. Oh, okay. And he said, you know, I didn't want to mess with it anymore. And he said, I gave it to the to the guys at the airport that always takes care of my stuff. And, you know, this is something older. He was probably putting around in down there or something, you know. And he said, you know, I gave it to him like two or three years ago. And he said, uh, he said I went to him. He said, uh, how long has it been since you uh, did the, you know, the rebuild on that? They said, well, hell, we haven't rebuilt that. That thing's been running great. <laughs> so it's been flying. <laughs> they just been flying it, never had it rebuilt. I got time. what, Rico, I got one stolen down in Mexico. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a house down there. Yeah. And still do now. Yeah. And, and I, I just had been out in California, and I had a, a stole plane, you know, short takeoff and landing plane. Yep. Because I'd kind of burned out. On the, the the better planes, yep. uh, flying too much, yep. and and so I f- go out to California. I get a new engine put in it, new tires on it, new brakes, new annual done to it, all fixed up nice. Flew it from there to Albuquerque, just loaded it up with all my stuff, headed to Mexico. And when I got down to Mexico, and I remember, I've got a sixty-five thousand dollar bill that I haven't paid yet. Okay. In other words, I just left California. I have an open account with a guy anyway. He's a real close friend. And I, and I go to Mexico, and my plane's gone. The drunker stole it. <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't even checked the oil the first time on that brand new engine. Oh, my God. I mean, yeah. I, mean, I get down there, and I says, they stole my plane? Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I got the, I got one of the head guys from Volkswagen of America and his wife down there with me as my guest, right? And no plane. <laughs> and I got no plane. No plane. And I got two oh. cats. Yeah. I don't have a wife then. <clears throat> I got two cats and those two people with me and no airplane to take them home. You know yep. I mean? <laughs> so we're so so you're racing open wheel, you're doing the sprint car stuff. And then how does Pikes Peak come along? Well, Pikes Peak, would, of course, would be every year for me. Yeah. It wouldn't have been for Parnelli, but, but remember what I said. He was the golden-haired guy in the whole country. So Ford Motor And Company, what was he running at the time? He was here. Stock car division. Stock oh, he car. Was, yeah, he had yeah. just. He no, had hadn't won here yet. Hadn't been here yet. No. Or won yet. Hadn't won yet. Yeah. And, and, and so. He's driving for Ford Motor Company in the stock car division, and but it's Mercury. Now, I always thought Ford Mercury, same, you know. Yep. Kind of, that's what I always thought, but but it wasn't. So so with Mercury is a big deal, and they hired Parnelli, and and the thing that, that was really neat about that whole deal, as soon as we saw each other, we liked each other. In other words, we became friends so fast it was just unbelievable. And and we were together every day because I didn't have to worry about Parnelli. He's not run. I'm running race cars. He's running stock cars. I already know he's probably the best driver in the whole friggin' world. But Pike speaks my cup of tea, you know. 
And so I can show him and teach him everything I know at Pikes Peak, which I've never done for anybody else except my own family. And, and so we were together every day doing our practice in, in a passenger car, you know, and just, and I'd, I'd just show him all my little secrets and all my little shortcuts. And through all of this, we became better friends and better friends and better friends. And just unbelievable. And then one day, just casually, he's talking to me, and he says, now he'd already been coming back here. You could see the bombs were about ready to go off for Parnelli Jones, see? Agajanian. I mean, there's two really big deals, you know? And, and so he says, you ought to come back and, and come to Indianapolis. And I says, no, you know, I wasn't too sure I wanted to do that. I... I, I didn't think I was good enough to come to Indianapolis, and, and I totally felt that way. You know, you don't have to beg Bobby Unser because if it was a freaking racetrack somewhere, I'd go to it. If there was any kind of a race car, I wanted to run it. But this place was too big for me. I mean, I wasn't, my head wasn't ready. I don't think I was ready with my driving skills. But Parnelli thought I was. Now, isn't that weird? In other words, here's a guy that just, just wins everything that he ever runs. And, and he thinks that Bobby Unser ought to come back here. So, so who I, was he running for at the time? Who was Parnelli running for? Agajanian. Agajanian, yeah. okay. I mean, yep. top of the pecking order yep. again, you know? And, and so to make a long story short, I just dropped the subject. I really didn't want to talk about it anymore. It wasn't part of what I wanted to do. I, I needed to go run a lot of sprint car races. Man, I, got, I, can, I can drive somewhere every, every week. I can, I'm busy, you know, right. midget races, yep. a lot of stuff to do. And I enjoyed that. And, and, and I did pretty good at it. But then I, I get home, and then the phone rings again. Parnelli's on the phone. He said, all right, I got your car to drive. Take your driver's test in. <laughs> I said, holy mackerel. This is getting too serious. This kid is not this screwing around. This is Pardelli called Bobby. Come on, get to Indianapolis. Yeah. I can't believe it. I think this is just not my cup of tea. I'm not, I'm not ready to do this. And, and, it, and it gets really embarrassing after that because <laughs> then somebody in Albuquerque hears about it. Now, in Albuquerque, I was already a legend because Lord only knows I won everything for, I mean, as a 16-year-old, I won the whole Southwest Championship in the Super Modified. Oh, wow. So I was like a child star. Yep. And all I know is it seems like it's pretty easy, and I'm having a ball. Yep. That's the reason I quit school. Yep. I mean, no, I mean. They forced you out. They forced me out. <laughs> My English. <laughs> well, you know what would happen, Rico, that would embarrass me so bad? <laughs> Go to school Monday morning. <clears throat> My English was real pretty. English teacher, I could remember that, and, and she'd make me stand up in front of the class, and she'd read the newspaper articles on Bobby just winning the races that weekend, and that used to embarrass me so bad, I just said, the heck with it, I'm not going to stay in this, this institution's not for me. Forced you out. Forced me out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, so then, so then so Parnelli's got it figured out, I'm going to come to Indianapolis, and and I really am afraid. So now. And what uh, what year? How old were you then? I uh, was probably probably around twenty two, twenty one, something like that. I was legal, in other words, legal age. I'd lied about my age all my life. <laughs> Every get you in Albuquerque, I'm going to show you. I did the motor. I lied about my. Age. I did the Mexican road race when I was seventeen years old, the first year, and on the on my illegal driver's license that I had to get AAA license. It says I'm 28. Well, that was a big lie. You know, I, mean, I never usually didn't lie that much, you know. You really stretched her out that time. Really uh, stretched that out. How old do you tell people you are right now? Are you 55? 56? No, I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 84 now. If, right. if Parnelli Jones hadn't pushed you to come to Indianapolis... How and you were about twenty two. I would have when never come. You never would have. I would have never come. Unbelievable. No. I mean, I had my heroes at Indianapolis. Tony Bentonhausen, he was one of my big heroes. He would stop by Albuquerque. We had a had a garage, 
tow cars, tow trucks, and a uh, gas station. And I mean, every year, he, he'd buy a new Cadillac every year. And I, I knew he and his wife, for some reason, I'm not going to remember, I'm a young kid, but I'm literally winning everything in our state. I'm, in other words, I'd already become a legend, see, as a young kid. Mm -hmm. and, and it didn't get to my head because still I had no money, you know. Didn't get any money for, for racing either. Mm -hmm. Did it all for nothing. I bought one thirty thirty rifle because I was really into deer hunting. That was my total racing for probably my first four and five years. See? And, and, and that was all right. The money you made got you up and down the road. And, got, went and to, the, went to the race car. Yep. Yeah. But I won all the races, so it was a good car. And yep. it was my dad's car. And yep. he didn't have the money to, to have extra nice stuff. We, had to be, we built everything. So, yeah. was, so, did your, so did your dad get into it as you started becoming more and more successful? He mm. had to be proud, right? Oh, yeah, because, yeah. I mean, I mean and, and my uncle had won Pikes Peak. Uncle Louie had won it nine times. Oh, wow. Now, Uncle Joe, the three of them, there was my dad, Jerry, then Uncle Joe and Uncle Louie, they were all three at one time. For the Coleman, C O L E M A N, truck in Denver, Colorado. And they, what they make it basically snow plows, four wheel or front wheel drives. And so they, were, they built an Indy car and just to come to Indianapolis. And they were going to have three of them. And the three boys were going to come back. And Uncle Joe got killed on the highway one day testing the car. They didn't have much pavement in those days. It's hard to imagine today because mm -hmm. we don't have much dirt anymore. It's all paved. Right. But in those days, <laughs> exactly. it was the other way around. It went the other way. So right. Uncle Joe was out on, on, the, on a paved road just south of Denver, and the car jumped off for some reason and got himself killed. And it, it was only recently, all of these years, what, 100 years goes by, whatever, some elderly guy, really nice historical organization in Albuquerque, came up with newspaper clippings that went back to 1915. And there it was. The absolute newspaper article, the original, where when Uncle Joe got killed. Exactly where on the highway. Oh, wow. And, and we thought he died on the highway. Yeah. Okay. But he, and I didn't even know what year it was. Yeah. I wasn't too sure about the year. And, and so the year now came to be, for sure, because my folks were both gone yep. by then. Mm -hmm. okay? yep. So a little mixed up. So we've, there it is in the newspaper clipping. The year, the exact place, the, and he actually died in the hospital. We didn't know that. Oh, wow. Wow, well, so he did jumped pass off out. the road. Yeah. And they, some, got him picked up and yeah. got him to the hospital. That's all in the newspaper. 1950. Yeah. I mean, wow. it can't be. These articles went back so far I couldn't believe it. And, and so it was, like, it was like really found out history. You know? yeah. And when they put the first motorcycle, sidecar and sidecar, on the top of Pikes Peak in history. Now, there is an article on that. What, <laughs> what, time a, hor they left. what a horrible idea, by the way. <laughs> Well, the time they left in the morning, Rico, the time they got to Glen Cove, the halfway place, and the time they got to the top, and the time they got back down to the bottom, and they're told about they tore up their tires because they couldn't keep it from going down fast, lock up the brakes, tear yeah. up the tires, yeah. that type of deal. It's all in the newspaper. I just couldn't believe it. I saw the picture or a video of you uh, on YouTube or something. Of running Pikes Peak, and you know I've 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 been around racing all my life. Uh, I love it; it's a passion. Uh, you know, there's there's some real genuine people in racing. You know, for the most oh. part, they can't be genuine assholes or genuine great people, but they are genuine <laughs> people, uh, one way or the other. But uh, you know, uh, we we sponsor a great deal of people in the open wheel sprint, midget, silver crown, USAC ranks if you will and you know watching them in the turns you know just uh, you know and the tire developments that they you know that hoosiers come up with you know and uh and so forth you know but it's crazy looking at that picture of you going up or watching that video of you going up pike's peak and you are completely crossed up 
coming through one of the turns and got tires on that are that that are smaller than you'd have on your car today. Those were recap tires. Even. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, and I mean, it was just, it, it, you know, you, uh, unfortunately there's a lot, there's, there's a few that are spoiled in this business these days. And, uh, that, uh, they like to bitch and complain about, you know, everything to do about this and that. And you know what? You have zero idea who paved the way for this. And you need a, you need to take a little refresher course on, Folks like you, folks like AJ, you know, Big Al, uh, and, and, you know, Steve uh, Rutherford. I mean, you know, the list goes on and on and on of the folks that went through. I mean, it was, uh, you guys were like test pilots. It wasn't like, hey, get in this. This thing is super safe. It's get in it, and I hope we see you after the race is over. <laughs> That's right. You know, and, uh, and uh, you know, Rick Mears, if it wasn't for uh, – you know, Terry Trammell putting him back together. He, he never would have walked walking. again. He would have never walked again. I mean, again. took the whole nose of the car and crushed his feet. And uh, So, I mean, it's just, but it's all of these developments that have happened along the way that have made it better, that have made it safer. We were talking about Bill Simpson uh, the other day when you were at the shop, you know. Uh, something would happen, Bill would try to find a solution for it. He wouldn't try. But, he would find a solution for yeah, it. Yeah. That guy is... I know sometimes we get mad at him and we want, we want to kill him. No <laughs> doubt about that. That's but part he, of the love for him. I know it, but <laughs> he's done more to save lives in all of motor racing than any single person that I can think of. And I that's mean, huge. before him, there was nothing. Nothing. In other words, my brother died right here because of burns. Yep, yep. Today, right. if if he'd have on a, a the stuff that Simpson. Invented. Pioneered, yep. Pioneered, yep. pioneered. That's yep. a better word. Yep. Jerry, it's, it wouldn't even be a hiccup this not right now if yep. that's what would happen. I mean, yep. I mean, today they they just wouldn't even pay that much attention to it. Okay, he'd have a few scars from the burns yep. and everything, but he hit him back. I don't even know if you have that anymore. You know, as as good as they've got it, you know. And but Bill, the way Bill started, you know, he told me the story, and and I was. Uh, you know, Bobby and I were talking about it. Bill says, you know, how I got started in the safety business. I said, no, I have no idea. And of course I love it. I want to hear this stuff. You know, this is, this is awesome stuff. And he said, well, I was 17 years old. I think he said 17. He said, I was 17 years old. And, uh, he goes, we were testing out this parachute. I said, yeah, he goes, yeah. And he goes, he goes, I had my station wagon and we had the back window rolled down in the station wagon and and the parachute hooked onto the onto the back of it, and we were throwing it out of the back of the car to see if it would catch the car and slow it down. I said, "Well, how in the hell did you come? I mean, where did that come from?" He said, "Well, you know, parachute in the air." And I mean, he's got an unbelievable. It's what we were talking about the other day. A beautiful mind. I mean, the the way he would think of things like that. So anyhow, he's talking about that, and he goes, he goes. So so I start, you know, and him and Perdome were childhood friends and grew up together so here you got the snake and simpson right which is a quite the duo in itself and uh and he's talking about it and he goes yeah you know who my first customer ever was i or he said first big customer i said no who's that and i mean and i can relate to this because you know what our first ever big customer was walmart mm -hmm. you know and when they called i thought it was a joke Nothing, nothing different. I thought it was somebody jacking with me. I really did, you know, <laughs> and nothing different than what Simpson went through. And, you know, he gets this phone call. This guy says, uh, are you the guy that's making those parachutes? And he says, well, yeah. He says, I want three of them. He said, well, you want three of them? He said, yes, I want three of them. I mean, hell, everybody could hardly afford to buy one, let alone three, right? He says, send me, he goes, uh, he goes, I want three of them. He goes, well, how, he goes, where are you? He said, well, I'm in Lincoln, Nebraska. He said, well, how in the hell am I going to get them there? I'm in California. And he says, go down to the Greyhound station. Now, keep in mind, there was no UPS. Mm -hmm. There was no FedEx. That's what you got to remember. The, 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 the mail did not carry parcels. The mail carried mail. 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 Okay. Uh, so he said, go down to the Greyhound station. He said, put it on this Greyhound bus until it needs to be at the Lincoln, Nebraska stop, and they'll get it to me. 
So this thing goes through a series of of uh, buses to get there. Well, Bill says, well, okay. He goes, well, how am I going to get paid? He says, well, I guess I'll send you a check if you send me a bill. <laughs> right? You know, it's like, well, how the hell is this? You know, I'm going to go, I'd go to races and somebody just give me the money and I'd get one, right? And uh, so anyhow, it, it, it turns out to be a gentleman by the name of Speedy Bill. And Speedy Bill owned... Uh, Speedway Motors in Lincoln, Nebraska, and is I would have to assume is the largest in the world in in, in that. You business. don't have to assume that, Father, because yeah. they are yeah. the largest in the world. Yeah, for and like catalog yeah. racing pieces, they make everything. Yeah, and they've got a museum there. So this is what we got got yeah. us talking about. It was yeah. kind of tied it all together. Mm-hmm. What we were talking about, they have a museum there. And this museum has been curated by Speedy Bill from all of the years, right? He has the original race shop of, help me out who it is, the Indy car. Did we figure out who that was? What Was it Shaw or somebody? The, the original race shop they took out and built back inside. Yeah, when I, I, didn't know, I didn't know Speedy Bill or any of the kids at the time. Yeah. I, in other words... It's another story how I met him. Yeah, so so anyhow, I don't remember where who this was, but Bill bought all this stuff when they were going to sell off this old indie car shop. You know, it would be, you know, uh, it would be uh, much like, uh, and I'm losing my thought here on who it is. I'll think of it in a minute. But one of the local guys here, you know, that built the old cars and stuff like that. Well, anyhow... So Bill's walking us through there, and I'm with Forrest Lucas. Now, we've flown in from Topeka or Brainerd. I can't remember which one it was, but we went to, we went there. And Speedy pulls up at the airport, and he's in this old, old Cadillac limo. Now, Speedy Bill wore a campaign hat all the time, like, you know, tilted, mm-hmm. you know, tilted. <laughs> And his, yellow, and his whole life. His whole life and <laughs> yellow glasses. His yeah. whole life. That was him. That was this. <laughs> you never had to wonder who that guy was. That was Speedy. Okay. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, he pulls up there and his son is driving the limo. Now, l- let me make it clear. They had enough money that they could have they could have sent anybody, anything that they wanted to pick us up. But it was Bill and one of his boys that runs the company for him at the time. It still does at that. At that, But they're picking us up. So then Forrest, myself, Forrest, and Morgan Lucas get in, the, get in the limo, and Speedy starts. He starts going. And he walks us through this museum. He's got the largest pedal car collection in the world. In the world. In the world. And I'm telling you, they all look brand new. It's ridiculous. The old metal pedal cars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I would venture to say there's $5 million plus million worth of pedal cars in that museum. And uh, he's got a Mercedes IndyCar engine that, that absolutely 100%. Roger Penske doesn't even have one of these engines. Mm-hmm. Okay. And speed <laughs> Theoretically, of- you can't get one. Yeah. They're- they're like government, you know. Ain't That's like happen. Chevy engine or a yeah. Honda. You yeah. can't get one of these engines. No, they will can't. not give no. you one of these engines. They're afraid somebody would take it, reverse engineer it, mm-hmm. and steal some of their proprietary information. So anyhow, he's going he's going on and on and on and four star going back to the airport and he says he says to me, he goes, uh, he says, He's proud of himself, isn't he? I said, and Forrest is a jokester, you know. He's, he's joking around. I said, I said that dude has done it, man. He has done it because he was the one. He was the first one I ever knew to tell me about how he used to ship. He said I used to show up at the Greyhound station with small block or short blocks, slide them on the belly pan. He said, them lazy ass uh, bus drivers that just sat there watching me out the window. It'd be raining like hell, and I'm, you know, and I mean, he's. And he was a great storyteller. Uh, unfortunately, uh, his wife passed, and he passed shortly thereafter. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it's it's people like him, people like you know Simpson, Bobby, the people that have made this business what it is today, mm-hmm. made this you know this exciting thing what it is today. 
And that's a lot of times people don't get where it comes from, how it got here. I mean, it just didn't show up on the front doorstep, all right? There was a lot of people, unfortunately, his brother, you know, perished. You know, Dale Sr. perished. You know, there's a lot of people that have given their lives for this, you know, to to make it what it is today. So, but... uh, I remember one day, Speedy Bill again. I, my, my youngest son, Robbie, needed to progress up. You know, we did the go-karts, then the late model dirt track stocks, and, and won all of them. And, and all of a sudden, I'd, I'd heard that Speedway Motors, Speedway Bill, is interested in, they're going to start a new series, take the old Indy cars, put Chevrolet engines in them, and race them. Now, that one made a lot of sense. No more expensive engines. Well, expensive, but not that bad. And or they naturally aspirated. Is that what yeah, they just, yeah. Totally so they, normally aspirated. Yeah. 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 The sprint car engines. Come on. Yeah. I mean, okay. All and right. I think, I don't know, I think we limited them, or they did, to 350, I think. Now, it really makes sense. Now, the, the, the old Indy cars you could buy for almost nothing in those days. You know how times change. Yep. Today you couldn't, but in those days you could. You know, you could five thousand bucks and buy almost any any car. Wow. That's a transmission. The tranny cost more than that. Yep. You know? Yep. At any rate, so I put my young son in my airplane there one day and we flew all the way to Lincoln. Now naturally I'd seen Speedy Bill because I worked the hot rod shows, if you want to call them. Yep. But I didn't you know, I didn't have to to do that, and, and and there was no reason to know him because, come on, he raced sprint cars. That's all, you know, nothing past that. So so I needed to go to work and meet this man, and I and I needed to talk to him because a museum is going to come up in Albuquerque. It's the one my brother has. So you got to learn. Now here's a smart man. Here's a really smart businessman. So I flew all the way to Lincoln, Nebraska, met that man, and asked him in detail how are we going to do a, a, a museum. And the biggest problem is, what are you going to do with it when you die? Now, I know I'm not trying to start a morbid conversation here, mm-hmm. but, but it's real. Mm-hmm. Nobody's going to make it forever. Right. So my interest is, what are you going to do when you die? What are you going to do with all of this? Got a lot of money. Okay, but his museum now, that's what I'm interested in. Museum, just like he says, millions of dollars, these little cars. I can't believe what, how about the engines he's got? Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, he's got a fortune there. Remember the Hot Wheels car that had the German helmet on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has that car, the car. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, so, it, I yeah. mean, so I flew all the way to Lincoln just to meet, not to meet Speedy Bill, but he knows who I am. He'll, he'll be honest with me. I already know that. And so I have a conversation with him. What are you going to do? Now, you die, what are you going to do? What, what, the kids are all going to fight over your money. I hated to do it, but I got right. Into, right. Into, the, into the hard talk, yep. you know. Yep. And that man had an answer for the whole friggin' thing. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I mean, and he'd spit them answers out faster than I could ask the questions. And what it is, it's the Smithsonian. He teamed up with the Smithsonian in Washington. Mm -hmm. So in other words, hey, there's nobody, no relatives, no no I promised, none of that stuff will overcome the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. So the day he died, that's who became the the technical boss. Like it or not, they are the boss. Yep. Now, the, the kids Which run is it. unbelievably smart. Oh, mm-hmm. I mean, so now I have the answer, you know? I yep. mean, I, did, I would have never thought of that. Because, because you, were think, you guys were thinking about doing it, right? Well, yeah, we were already, already mm-hmm. into thinking about yep. it. But, but you're not there, and you don't know what to do. do you, you know, Al's got what? He's got, he's got two daughters he starts out with and a son. Well, the two daughters die, Okay. So now he's got a son left. And so what's he going to do with his? I mean, he's not a poor man anymore, so <sighs> what's he going to do? Same thing. You've got to learn this stuff. 
And you don't learn it by talking to the poorest people. Go talk to the the ones that really made a couple the ones of that bucks. still have it, yeah. right? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and that's how I that's how I started yep. with Speedy Bill. Yeah. Of course, I ended up with Carson, is one of his kids, and he and Robbie hooked up into racing together, and I'd help them do Pikes Peak cars and stuff like that. But it, it was ended up being a real fun deal, and Robbie still works there today. You said he shows up, right, or does he Shows work up. Well, no, I didn't see it. I, <laughs> I, I misused the one word. <laughs> That's what he said the other day. But <laughs> yeah. they're, they're a great family, and, and, and you know, um, I, of course, have got to know you and have got to know your wife, and uh, it, it, was, it was pretty it was pretty awesome the other day. I was I was in Arkansas for a meeting uh, with with Walmart, and uh, Lisa's texting me, "Hey, we want to make sure we see you. Want to make sure we see you." And I'm just sitting around killing time because we we had a later meeting that day. Yeah, excuse then, me, just a second. Yeah, you gotta remember now. He's already sent me a fair amount of glasses. Hasn't charged me a penny for it. Mm-hmm. I did try to pay him, but yeah, yeah not it, charged that ain't me. Happening. That ain't going to happen. He's that got it all for paid sure. forward, so, so I'm so good with it. I had to come and say hi to it, okay. but says, no matter what. You're yeah. like, I'd rather buy the glasses so I don't have to say hi to Rico. Yeah, right, whatever. <laughs> That's you, Adam. But anyhow, uh, but the next thing you know, my phone rings, and it's an Albuquerque number, and I'm like, hello. He says, hey, it's Bobby. I said, what are you doing? And we just start talking. And he says, I want to make sure we get together. I said, well, I'll be back on. I'll be back in the office Wednesday. I said, I'm out Monday, Tuesday. And he goes, well, I want to make sure I get together. I said, well, yeah. I said, Lisa and I are going to say, well, she didn't tell me that we're meeting with you. <laughs> so here I am getting Lisa. Well, tell, you know. I'm only the boss. Sometimes yeah. they forget to tell me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anyhow. I know you have some things to finish up, and maybe we can get together and talk again when you get here for the vintage car race, which is coming up here in a couple of months. And uh, That's the fun time, Rico. That is. That is. <laughs> now, one of our fun times, I should yeah, say. Yeah. yeah. We, make, we make it fun no matter what, so yeah. that's, the, that's the best part. But thank you for being a friend and, uh, and uh, your support with our products and anything we can ever do for you, we're, we're here. Well. You got the good stuff because you got your head. That's where the good stuff comes from, you know. That's the way it is. It's like we talked about Simpson. It's all the same way. If there isn't a leader, it doesn't happen. Yeah. So I got the leader. I found him. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the commercial again. But anyhow, so <laughs> we'll wrap it up. Adam? All right. Well, uh, three-time Indy 500 champion Bobby Unzer, thank you so much for stopping by the Fathead Suite and uh, being a guest on The Skinny with uh, Rico. And I'm Adam Ritz. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for you guys having me. I'm sorry the Indy 500's over. I thought it ought to go another month. You know, I'm just starting to have a good time. (laughs) Well, it used to go a whole month in May. No, two weeks. Jeez, it, I just get warmed up in the two weeks. That's right. You know? I think they'll bring it back soon, I hope. This episode of The Skinny has been brought to you by Fat Heads, the undisputed leader in oversized eyewear. Check out all of our great products at fatheads.com. A podcast version of The Skinny is available on iTunes and ricoelmore.com. 